Anyway, um, my name's Chris Barrington-Brown. Uh, I'm here to try and tell you about where you might find terrorists. Um, I run a small, uh, perfectly formed, we like to think, uh, software company in southern England. Uh, there are eight full-time, four part-time people. Most of us are ex-military. Um, we have a background in working out whereabouts to put air defense missiles around things that need defending. Uh, so the British and the Malaysians uh, use our software to do that. Um, we then moved into working out where the bad guys might put their missiles to shoot down our aeroplanes, or indeed anyone's aeroplanes. Uh, and so all of the major airports in the UK, the US, Australia, France, Morocco, um, use our software around their airports or around their military bases uh, to send police or military to find um, terrorists who might uh, shoot you down when you're going off on holiday. Um, and, but we've now moved into more general counterterrorism, working about where rockets, mortars, snipers, those sorts of things should be. At the moment, we sell that product to the UK, but uh, I'm hoping later to the world. Uh, we'll see. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Imagine that you are a policeman or a soldier. Um, I want to know where the terrorist's going to shoot from. Let's suppose I'm guarding a VIP, or I'm guarding a nuclear power station, or a crowded place like a football field or something. Um, I want to know where the terrorist is going to shoot from. I want to know whereabouts I should deploy my resources to stop him from shooting at me. I want to know how to search that area and how to, to note which bits have been searched and which haven't and when they were last searched and by whom and so on. What help can I get? There might be CCTV cameras, there might be little old ladies with lace curtains that twitch and tell me that someone nasty is uh, hanging around. There's all sorts of other help I can get, but I need to log all of that. Um, I want to tell people what's happening. So once I've got a plan to dominate the area and make sure that uh, terrorists can't attack me, I need to put that plan out so that the police can action it, so that the newspapers know about it, and so on. How do I record what I've done? Because if something goes horribly wrong, I'll guarantee that I'm going to be in front of a judge at some uh, um, uh, parliamentary inquiry where with 2020 hindsight, everyone's going to know much better than I did what happened. So I need to be able to justify why I made the decisions that I made. And what's more, they're cutting my budget. I haven't got enough people. I haven't got enough time. So I've got to do all these things faster and with less people. So in order to do that, we came up with a product called Rampress, which uh, it came from Sampress. We had this product called for surface-to-air missiles. Uh, they used to be a tennis player, but uh, seems to have disappeared. But anyway, we have to have a dash in between Sam and Press to make sure that there's no copyright. Uh, and then when the new product came, it was simple to call it Rampress. So that stands for the Rocket Mortar Position Ranking and Analysis System. Of course, it had a meaning long after it had a name. Uh, and it's a C++ front end, uh, it's got a SQL Server back end, uses Esri's file geodatabase to store everything using Arc Engine to get at it. Um, and my world is slightly different from your world. I believe you use something called the internet. Well, when you're in a trench in Afghanistan, you haven't got it. You're lucky if you've got a piece of wet string uh, with a little bit of data coming down at about one kilobyte an hour. Um, you have to assume all of your mapping is local. You have to assume that you've got no connectivity, that you've got classified output, that your machine is locked down. Quite possibly there's uh, super glue in the USB sockets to stop you attaching a USB device to it. That's in the really intense areas. Um, and what's also really horrible is that there's a nasty man with security controller written on his hat uh, who insists that when a piece of software comes along, he has six months to climb all over it to check that it doesn't damage anything. And then when you come along and say, I've got a new version, he says, I'll have another six months, please. So every time you change one line of code, the whole thing has to go back through accreditation. Now, that's bad news for me as a software developer because my customer says, he never, of course, says it to my software, but there's a bit of a bug and we'd like it fixed. Normally, he comes and says, Actually, there's a new requirement which I hadn't thought of. Could you please uh, enhance your software? Here's some money to do it. And I say, great, no problem at all. And I fix the software. And then it doesn't get onto his system for another six months because of this accreditation. And I get the blame because I'm not responsive enough. 
It's not his security problem. It's my problem for not being responsive enough. So let's just have a look at some practical stuff. Um, here, is, here is a small airport near, near where I live, uh, Southampton in southern England. Um, it has been slightly distorted by the, the stretching of the screen. It, that is a circle. In the, but you all know about projections anyway, so it's not a problem. Um, so if, in the worst case, uh, I've got a mortar that might wish to shoot at the terminal building in the middle of that airport, and I've got a fence around the airport, and I hope that my mortar is not going to be fired from inside the fence. The worst case is I've got a minimum range and a maximum range, and everywhere within that circle, the mortar could fire from. That's a pretty horrible amount of, of space to go looking at. But if I apply a bit of intelligence, uh, I can cut that down. Let's put some rules in, and I know that this mortar has got to have line of sight from where it fires to the target. I know it won't fire at more than a certain angle. I know that because it's big and heavy, the terrorist has never carried it more than a certain number of meters from a road. I know all of these things, and so by putting those in and doing some geoprocessing, I can reduce the amount of, of uh, area that I, as a policeman or a soldier, need to go looking at. So you can see there that it's actually that's an appalling picture. Sorry, you'll have to look at the slides when they come out uh, on the web. Um, but there are different shades of, of red and pink there. And basically, the redder it is, the more likely the terrorist is to go to those places. And if there isn't a color red there, he's not going to go there. So as a policeman, I now know where to focus my efforts in order to minimize the resources. A few other things that we might want to do, we might put some sensors on, so standard view shed stuff. For GIS professionals, trivial. To a policeman who used to do it by hand, this is magic. They've never seen anything like it before. Wow, you can tell me what that sensor will be able to see when I put it there. Yes, I can. Fantastic. Here's some money. Um, You'll also notice that, that we want to shade things. So for example, where it's green, it means only one sensor can see it. Where it's blue, multiple sensors can see it. So I can start to see where I have got uh, critical points of failure. Um, so I can also have overlays for day and night, for rain, and, and so on. What about an active shooter? I've got a nutter with a gun um, for the science part yesterday, for example. Um, I would quite like to know where he can shoot because knowing that helps me to put the innocent people out where he can't shoot and get my SWAT team in. Um, so this, this sort of tool is, is good. And we can search things so we can just pull out all the vectors of all the buildings uh, and then we can attach metadata to them to say, Team A searched this building on this date and this is what they found and here are some pictures and all that sort of thing. At the moment, that's done by putting a big paper map on the wall, and you color in each little square as you go to it. Well, let's do it on the computer so you can search it. What percentage have we done? How long will it take us to do the rest of it? Click on that building. Show me the reports. Now, how are we all going to get all of that down to the front line? And that could be a policeman who um, uh, has just got a mobile phone or an iPad or something, or it might be a soldier in a trench somewhere. So what we decided to do was not the sensible way of doing it, which is put it all on some webby thing and have a server and process it and web services and all that. I haven't got that infrastructure. So we decided to use layered PDFs. So we create rasters out of all of our, our, um, our maps as BMPs. Um, we produce all the vector data as shape files, and then we produce all the coverages and view sheds and so on as PNGs. And we use um, a, an FME workspace runner. So we bundle FME uh, in the back of our software. It doesn't have any user interface, but we, we use FME objects, and we create a layered PDF. And if this works, then the sort of thing that we'll get would be, can I have my thing back? It's probably on a different screen, is it? Is it over here somewhere? Wow, that's difficult. Ooh. Um, so I, I've got uh, the ability here to to switch off my, my street view, he said, trying desperately to steer on this thing. Uh, and I've got another map behind it. And now you're really confusing me. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, you get the idea. So um, what we're trying to do is to move something which is quite small. Um, so there we're talking about moving two or three megabytes of data. 
rather than the 200 gigabytes of data which is sitting on this machine which does the original um, uh, thing. Can I have the, do I have to do anything? Alt tab. No? No. I have a technologist and I can't even drive this thing. Um, I need someone to tell me when I go back to this. Hurrah! Thank you. So anyway, now we've bought FME, thank you very much, um, and embedded it in all our software, we can do a few other things, which is quite nice. Um, we sell our software all over the world, and every country has different formats. Well, in the past, we used to have to write different converters to ex ex extract it and put it into, into our Esri file data database back end. Now we can use FME to do all of that. Um, we now can use FME to do most of our geoprocessing, um, and that means we don't have to buy an Esri Spatial and an Esri 3D Analyst license, which is nice. But the other really cool thing is that because the workspace is just a text file, when my user now says, uh, could you fix this bug, or could you give me this extra functionality, I can do that by creating new workspaces and sending them to him, and they're just a text file, and at the far end, I give him the ability to run an arbitrary text file, and suddenly, I'm a hero again, because I'm responsive. You know, he sends me a problem in the morning, the following morning, he's got an answer, uh, and uh, it's great. So there we go. No need to be re-accredited. Any questions, delighted to uh, um, try and, and do that, but in 10 minutes to try and give you 25 years of where we've gone through all of this is a little difficult. Um, if you want to see the real system, I have it on my laptop, stop me and ask me. Uh, and if you want to talk about it, there is my detail. Any questions?